Otherwise, uh, to have Rabbi Professor Norman Lamb here for a third lecture in uh, Changing Jewish Community Studies this year. It's a program which we are uh, trying to to build up into a mature program like the uh, post Holocaust and anti-Semitism. Usually, I only mention at the anti-Semitism sections where many of you come uh, about recent developments. But as we will not have, I think, another lecture in either of the two series until the 9th of May, when Rijk van Dam will sp speak here, former <coughs> Euro parliamentarian, who now is the chief lobbyist of the Christian various Christian groups in Brussels or for in favor of Israel, uh, I would like to mention developments at least in one country of the last uh, two weeks, which are increasingly worrying. The continuous incidents, uh, severe incidents in France. The last one uh, was uh, in, the last one which has been reported on, was in Saint-Denis, where two, where two Africans came into a Jewish, uh, into a Jewish shop uh, and were aggressive. The people uh, of the shop offered them money they were not interested in money, they were interested in cutting up the, uh, the owner of, of the shop. And we see in France increasingly African Muslims, which is a new phenomenon uh, since uh, in France there is an African who is not even a Muslim, I believe. Jules Donnet, who, who is probably today the, lead, the leading anti-Semite in France, most outspoken anti-Semite in France, uh, is a half-African uh, called Dieu Donné, and he really uh, incites the African community against Jews. Now to our own, uh, to our own uh, subject of today, I for a long time wanted uh, to have uh, Professor Lamb here because he, uh, not only because he's the uh, head of now of the yeshiva, of the yeshiva, of the yeshiva University. Before that, for a long time, stood uh, at the, was at the head of the flagship of American modern orthodoxy, but also because there's probably no thinker in the world who has given as much attention to this, uh, uh, what characterizes modern orthodoxy, where is it uh, going. Uh, usually the introductions can, uh, have to say something about the speaker, this is a speaker I have to say very little because he's so well known. Rabbi Professor Norman Lamb received three degrees from Yeshiva University, PA, PhD, rabbinic ordination. He was 25 years in the pulpit, 27 years president of Yeshiva University. He's now the university's chancellor and head of the Yeshiva. He has authored 10 books, which some of which have been translated into a number of languages. Norman Lamb, it's a great honor to have you here. Thank you very much, Dr. Grayson, for with you. I remember the about the fellow who was introduced um, by a chairman who said that uh, when the President of the United States is introduced, there are no elaborations. He simply says, ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. So about the present speaker, the less said, the better. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> my, my topic is the future of modern orthodoxy. I, I'll begin with a, par a statement from the Talmud with which you may be acquainted. That Miyon Shechara Bet HaMikdash Nitna Levua Minaviyim Benitna Lishtino Kvishotib Etino Kot. Since the day the temple was destroyed in the year 70, the gift of prophecy was taken away from the prophets and given to fools and to children. Since I don't qualify as a child, uh, I therefore am fully confident that you will agree that uh, I have the right to prophecy. <laughs> modern orthodoxy. What are the what are the bases of modern orthodoxy? Modern orthodoxy is a is a form of orthodoxy. It's orthodox, but it has it is open to the outside world. And I would say they're following basic ideas, uh, basic theories, basic principles of orthodoxy and modern orthodoxy. Are number one Torah Mada, or to use the English, which follows the Yiddish Torah Mada. Uh, well, which I mean, uh, 
I'm, I'm, I'm an American, so our Hebrew very often is Yiddish accented. Um, Torah Mada means that uh, Mada does not mean as it normally is taken to mean science in a, in a natural science sense, but rather uh, Mada as culture. Uh, it, that's more of a medieval term. The Rambam has Sefer HaMada, which means really Jewish culture uh, in a very profound sense. So when we say Torah Mada, it means Torah, you know, Jewish, uh, Jewish uh, complete Jewish fealty to, to the Bible and to the oral lives that develop, and uh, together with that, a deep respect for and working in uh, the areas of the culture of Western civilization. Second, an attitude to the state of Israel. Third, I'll talk about it in more detail, the role of women. Uh, next, inclusiveness. And finally, a mode of speaking, a mode of reacting, and that is moderation. Uh, these basically define what modern orthodoxy is all about. And I'm going to speak about what it is, the problems that it has, and from that we possibly can conjecture about what <coughs> it's the future holds for it. I tell you immediately, though, that I am, I really am not a, no navi an evil ben navi, I'm neither a prophet nor a prognosticator. Uh, I can only conjecture, and I probably will be wrong. Torah uh, Mada. Uh, this is the logo of the yeshiva, of the yeshiva university, and therefore modern orthodoxy. And it really goes back, the term goes back to Rabbi uh, Yitzhak Yaakov Rhinus uh, in Lithuania, uh, who before World War I had founded a yeshiva based upon the idea that we are not interested only in Torah, but educate, Jewish education should mean uh, Torah, but also a relationship, a, a tension between Torah and uh, Western civilization or secular knowledge. Um, this was the concept on which Yeshiva University was founded uh, after the very beginning, I should say, of the first few years <coughs> when the Jewish migration to the United States uh, began to come in heavily. Uh, it was basically an old-time Yeshiva, but then since they had to face a new kind of public uh, of American Jewry, one that was assimilating, or at least acculturating, it had to, uh, it had to uh, also develop a, a way of approaching it. So the student, because of the students themselves, it became the flagship of the concept of Torah and Mada. Uh, and when I, when I was a student, we all knew that that was the case, but very few of us had any real knowledge of its philosophical content, its theological content, what it really meant. Uh, so when I became president, I had no excuse when students ask me the same questions that I asked and never got an answer for it. So I thought about it, wrote about it, lectured about it, and students now are much more well-informed. Uh, occasionally, in certain parts of orthodoxy, the concept of Torah Mada was dumbed down. Uh, you know the expression, dumbing down. Uh, it, it was reduced, and it became not Torah Mada, but in certain groups, Torah Uparnasa. That means uh, how to make a living. So they, they, they said, if you're learning how to, uh, how to be an accountant and you're studying Torah, that's Torah Umada. Well, I suppose it passes muster to a certain extent, but that's not, exact, not really what uh, I meant, what the founders of the university meant uh, when we put Torah Umada as the centerpiece of our institution. Uh, what, we, what I mean by Mada is the full impact of Western civilization, history, philosophy, language, thought, uh, sociology, the whole array of academic, uh, of academic uh, teachings, or academic, at least, interests. Um, so it is not only a matter of vocations, not only a vocational matter, but more than, it's more than technical knowledge. Uh, so far, I would say, it is accepted by all the students of yeshiva and most of the faculty of yeshiva. When I say most of the faculty, uh, some of the faculty in the secular subjects are not themselves observant, so it no longer is that important to them. And in the, in the REITs, which means the rabbinic faculty, uh, there are more, more <laughs> rabbis now of the faculty who are committed to Torah Mada than there were earlier. Many of them were teaching at yeshiva, but did not really assent to that basic principle of, the, of, of modern orthodoxy, namely Torah Mada, but that is, pre, that is getting better. 
there is no opposition to it. There is a great deal of some. There is some ambivalence. I must tell you that having a PhD is not a guarantee of being open and moderate. <laughs> some of my most moderate people and my most understanding people have no PhDs. Some who do have PhDs, well, they don't exactly impress me. Uh, but I think that gradually this will prevail. It is already prevailing in, in modern orthodoxy. State of Israel. Uh, the state of Israel in, in modern orthodoxy has a very positive attitude to maybe not Israel. Uh, you know, unlike the Haredi brethren who recognize only Eretz Yisrael, but not Medinat Yisrael, only the Holy Land, but not the state, uh, we, we believe, despite all the differences and nuances amongst many of us, but we accept that the founding of the State of Israel is a, not only a good thing, it's a historic change, which we accept as uh, something that came from providence as well as anything else that comes from providence. We disagree with the idea that this is an aberration, as if God wasn't looking when the state was founded. Uh, it's not exactly uh, a consistent religious theory. Uh, so we accept it openly, uh, and uh, there are problems, however. Uh, at the very beginning, um, when, when the Tivada Mishlom Medina, the prayer for the State of Israel, uh, was formulated was by Rabbi Herzog. Exactly who wrote it is still a matter of conjecture. Probably it was uh, Shai Agnon. Uh, whatever it is, it became popular. It's accepted now all over. But there are three words that are problematic. The three words are Reshit Tzimichat Geulatenu, to affirm that we plead, we ask God's <coughs> blessings for the state of Israel, which is the beginning of the growth, uh, of the emergence of uh, our redemption. I never said those words, and I, I always say the prayer, I always skip those words. Uh, I didn't even realize it, that my own teacher, Rabbi Soloveitchik of blessed memory, who was really the, the great, the giant figure in modern orthodoxy, that he also was opposed to it. I only found this out last year. Um, and uh, it's something which I object to. I don't want to go into the reasons for that objection unless you want to ask me later on. Um, but I just, I don't accept I'm, I'm wary of all messianic elements because they lead ultimately, if overstated, it's, it's to frustration. Uh, without it, you know, without it, you have no hope. Without it, it's very difficult to develop any hope and any confidence in the future. With it, if taken to extremes, if taken out of its context, can become a dangerous element. It's like fire. You can't live with it, you can't live without it. Uh, or rather, you can live with it only if it's banked and well. Uh, and the same thing is true of the, of the, the attitude of Reshitz uh, Michakul Latena as if we're living in Messianic times. So I'm, I'm telling you my own prejudice uh, of my confrères, my colleagues in, in modern orthodoxy, I'm in the minority. Uh, I think what's happening in Israel now uh, is a, um, something that will affect uh, our people as well. In, in the United States, and I suppose other Western countries, it's a very serious issue. Uh, I'm not speaking about the saying of the prayer, of prayer for the State of Israel. Very serious issue. How do we approach the whole problem, the whole issue of the modern State of Israel once you uh, see that it is not a messianic state? So those of us who are who never were never approved of it, and I, I didn't approve it from the day that they founded the Gush Emunim quite a number of years ago. Uh, but others will have difficulties uh, that are go very deep and are also have psycho, deep psychological consequences, which I think you all are aware of. All of you who are in Israel certainly are aware of that. It's, it's a crisis of religious Zionism, uh, and uh, it's a crisis that will have to be resolved sooner or later, although I'm optimistic that after all the stur storm and the dying, or dying storm, all the storming and, and, and hollering and screaming and worrying, I have a feeling it's going to blow over and life will return uh, to at least a degree of normalcy. Uh, not because we are normal people, I don't think we are, it's, it's, our, it's our curse and our blessing at the same time, uh, but because uh, we have other problems that are far more severe, such as uh, the Islamic world. And uh, I must tell you that the, 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 the love for Israel is very strong in modern orthodoxy. Uh, I would say that uh, um, our students, we probably have about 2,000 
of our graduates are on Aliyah. Uh, we have on the average now about 650 students, young men and women, who come for a minimum of one year study in Israel. Many of them go back for Shana Bet, some Shana Gimel, then we lose them completely. Uh, but they, uh, uh, it really means a great deal. Israel is very much a part of our, our culture. You know, I, I, I know the students who graduate from Yeshiva. I've known them now for quite a long time. I don't think today you could find more than two or three percent who have not even thought about going to Israel and Aliyah. Everyone talks about it. Everyone talks about it. Most of them who talk about it really mean it, and some go. Some go. A, a, a significant number of them do go on Aliyah, but it's a um, modern Orthodox who really is, is proud of these youngsters. Although I must tell you, a considerable cost to the university. Uh, you figure we have 650 students a year who don't pay us tuition. Then they come back, not for a four-year course, but for a three-year course, because we give them credit. Uh, so we lose a, a, a quarter of our income from tuition. Any of you who run a university knows that that is a significant amount of money. Uh, in addition to which, uh, when they come back, they are fired with enthusiasm. It reminds me of the president of Columbia, who uh, during the turbulent 60s was once asked about his experience in Columbia. He said, I was fired with enthusiasm. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, these, uh, these students are fired with enthusiasm. And sometimes we have a problem of calming them down. They come with tremendous idealism and tremendous religious idealism, nationalistic idealism, Israel enthusiasm, and we have to teach them to calm down and integrate, integrate what they have as part of their lives, as a beautiful part of their lives. But they have to function normally too, and they, they come back from a year of, of studying only and thinking only and you know relating to Jewish matters only, and they suddenly come back and have a program that's a dual program. I don't know if you realize it. The Yeshiva University has a, um, a, from 9 to about 2 or 3 p.m. is all Judaic Jewish studies, uh, especially Talmud, but all, the, all other areas as well. And then they go to their secular studies, uh, which means the full array of academic courses of any university. You know, when I became president in 1976, I called together many uh, top uh, uh, academicians throughout the country, Jewish and non-Jewish, to take a look at what we're doing and give me an idea of where we ought to go from here. It hadn't been looked at in 30 years. They came down, they looked, it was a magnificent group. Then at the, at the exit interview, uh, one fellow was a professor of uh, sociology at Princeton, I forget his name, a tall, bold fellow, a Jewish fellow, got up and said, you know, I think that this institution, this university, is the only genuine Jesuit college left in the country. <laughs> well, see, he was really impressed uh, by, by, the, by the intensity of the program. And anyway, I'm not here to make an appeal for yeshiva. Uh, uh, what we expect from Israel, of course, is a sense of cooperation. Uh, we'd like to see good role models uh, sent to us. Don't, don't always have that. Uh, a very distinguished personality of Israel who should have known better. I liked him very much personally, so I won't mention his name. Even if I didn't like him, it would be Lashon Hara. Uh, very distinguished man came, spoke to the, the Bamboard Auditorium, which is a, had over a thousand students there, full of enthusiasm, and uh, giving him a roaring welcome and singing all kinds of Hebrew songs to welcome him. And the gist of his message was that what does it mean to be a lover of Israel when you're in America? To root for our hockey team. <laughs> We all felt uh, a sense of utter depletion uh, that we were so totally misunderstood that we had he had taken something so precious and reduced it uh, to Barim Shal Mabakach, to things that were just trivial and nice. Anyway, uh, but not all people are that way. Uh, may, many Israelis come to Yeshiva are, are impressive and are impressed. And it's something that we're very proud of, very happy about. Uh, let me go as fast as I can. Uh, I mentioned education of women. Uh, we are all, uh, we are now developing, have now developed something quite revolutionary in Jewish life. Uh, we provide uh, for Jewish women at Stern College, our undergraduate women's college, uh, major in Talmud. And some of our students now, uh, we have a special department of postgraduate full-time Talmud study for women, a two-year program. They receive the same stipends that the men do in the Kolel. And uh, they're fabulous. 
uh, I, my own granddaughter was a graduate of that program, and I says, mind-boggling. Uh, I don't think I was as advanced in Gemara as she is at this point, and she's now teaching the Talmud in a high school. Uh, I have quite a number of such young women who are absolutely first-rate, and they don't want to become rabbis. They're too smart for that. Uh, but they, they, this is a development um, we're talking about, but it's, it's, I don't have time to go into it, but it really is a, a major development that marks us off from the rest of the Haredi world, the rest of the Orthodox world, certainly. Um, we, have, uh, uh, we have efforts now, uh, strong efforts at outreach, although uh, it's not the major thing that we do. Uh, we try to give our students uh, a sense of open-mindedness, and it's difficult, you know? I have students in the Kola like These are students who have gone through four years of college and Talmud study, then four more years of studying for the rabbinate, and then they come back for three more years as a maximum. They, my, many Kola, let's call them, uh, take them until they're age 40 or 50, and then they go to leave the Kola and they do, basically don't have anything to do. Uh, it's, it's a serious problem in the, in the Karebi world. But with our students, we take them there for a maximum of three years. So they've had now four years of high school, four years of college, four years of smicha, three more years. It is impossible to have this kind of very intense program, and they emerge as full-fledged full -fledged scholars, full-fledged tabidi chachamim. It's, a, it's impossible that they shouldn't have a sense of a cloister, being cloistered, and not being able to relate to the outside world, even though they have gone through a whole academic discipline. So what I do with them is every second week I meet with them from 12 to 2 and we have speakers. Normally the speakers I invite are way to the right of them or generally more to the left of them. The whole, my whole point being that they have to learn how to react and how to dialogue with and interact with people other than modern orthodox or orthodox. And indeed, uh, I'm very proud of them because uh, the speakers who come uh, I'd rather take it back what they see. They see normal people. Uh, they see young men who are dressed properly, who actually speak English the way English ought to be spoken, <laughs> not, not what they call English. You know what English is? It's a patois yeah. that developed of yeshiva type English. You know, it's, it's a half Yiddish, half English, and the English isn't necessarily grammatical. Uh, but um, they speak English. They ask sharp questions, always respectful. The result is, that as much as our students are impressed by the speakers, the speakers are impressed by the students. My point is, we open them up and try to open up their minds as much as we can. Uh, we are, we are, uh, uh, we try very hard. For instance, past the uh, intercession, which just concluded quite recently, uh, we sent our students uh, all over the world. They were in Israel, of course. They were in Germany. They were in Honduras. They were, you know. Uh, they were all over the world doing things. In Honduras, a group of young men and young women, Stern College and Yeshiva College students, went there and they built a school. Not if I said, that mean they talked about building a school. They actually they took the, 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 the cement and the, and the rocks and the, whatever it is, and they literally built a school in a town where, which never saw a Jew before. Uh, and this produces a Kiddush Hashem uh, on one side, and on the other side, gives our students that sense of being involved with the world, as well as very much uh, with our own people. Um, we have experienced a degree of acceptability in the United States, which is really remarkable. I could never, never have thought of it when I was a child, and I'm American-born. Well, not really. I'm Brooklyn-born. Uh, <laughs> not necessarily American-born. Um, uh, but a uh, uh, United States Senator, Lieberman, Vice President Candidate, uh, is an observant Jew, could never have happened before. We have people, uh, you're our ambassador to, of the United States to Israel until recently, Danny Kurtza, was a graduate, he was my student when I was teaching the yeshiva. I made him dean of the college, the youngest dean that we ever had. And whether you approve of his particular uh, political philosophy and ideas, that's beside the point. But the point is that he came up the, up the ranks and was ambassador to, to Israel. Uh, we are now involved in a limited way an interconfessional dialogue. I had two visits uh, with uh, about 15 princes of the Catholic Church. A whole bunch of cardinals came to visit yeshivas. We're talking about it on another occasion because they're very piquant and very 
just interesting how all these um, members of the cloth uh, came and wanted only one thing from me. They wanted to visit the Beit Midrash, where our students studied Talmud in their own particular way. Uh, these people, their mind, it was mind-blowing for them. They, they still don't believe it. And they wrote to me, they, they wanted to come again. So I said a second time, okay, I'll take another group. This time it was mostly Indians, Asians, and Africans. Uh, and they wanted to have a third one. I said, no, <laughs> I, I can't handle more than two cardinal groups at the same time. Uh, besides that, students have to study too. This is it's an intrusive uh, visit. At any rate, this could never have happened years before then. Uh, now, let me talk now about modern orthodoxy.